So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good afternoon to you all. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to um, uh, welcome you to this event on Women and Peace, a discussion on rights, representation and resources. It is also my pleasure and honor to welcome back to IPI Sweden's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Margot Wallström, good friend and old colleague, uh, who will be discussing the linkages between women's rights and peace. Despite um, two decades of policy development and commitments intended to support women and girls affected by armed conflict, women's participation uh, in peace and security decision-making lags behind. This is due to structural barriers, lack of access, and even threats to women who attempt to participate in these processes. In efforts to build and to sustain peace, there remains a widespread neglect of local level women peace builders and expertise. Formal peacemaking efforts continue to be resistant to women's participation and to women's rights. This happens despite increasing recognition that efforts to build and sustain peace are dependent upon the full participation of women and a respect for their rights. Sweden has been a strong and very vocal champion of women's rights in its foreign policy. The country also focuses heavily on issues of women, peace and security, it did so in its 2017-2018 tenure at the UN Security Council. During her time as foreign minister, Margaret developed the world's first feminist foreign policy. And this initiative has been a catalyst for a worldwide conversation about what it means to embed women's rights and gender equality in government's global engagement. Margaret has been a strong advocate for the rights and the needs of women throughout her political career, notably as special representative of the UN Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict in the years 2010 to 2012. Margaret has a long career in politics, which first began in 1979, when she served as a member of the Swedish parliament she had uh, numerous ministerial posts and has been foreign minister of Sweden since 2014. She also has extensive experience outside Swedish politics, including European Commissioner for the Environment from 1999 to 2004. And she was co-founder of the European Union Interinstitutional Group of Women and a key supporter of the 50-50 campaign for democracy by the European Women's Lobby. So please, please uh, join me now in welcoming an outstanding diplomat and advocate for peace, women's rights and representation. Welcome to us, Margaret. Thank you, Thank you very much, um, Tarje. Thank you so much to all of you for coming and, um, and being willing to listen to me and spend some time uh, with us here. Um, I think I would like to say something about hope and despair. And I realize that those two contrasts have been, and opposites have been following me in a lot of the things that I've been doing over the last uh, years. Um, I think it was definitely there uh, when I worked as the UN Special Representative on Conflict-Related Sexual Violence. And I think it shaped so much of my understanding of, of the world. And it was really both hope and despair. It was despair because of, of um, uh, the situation for all of these, uh, particularly women who um, were victims of sexual violence and, and rape and all kinds of, of abuse. And they were also poor and, and they were um, they were really uh, desperate, um, but also the hope that they brought, because they were not, they did not want to be identified only as victims. They really wanted to play a role in their societies, in their families, in their countries, and in, in the world. And um, I was thinking, if they can, 
pick up the pieces from their often very shattered lives, then why can't we? Of course, of course we can and must do everything we can. But also from a recent trip that I made together with uh, DSG uh, uh, Mohammed uh, Amina and also with women from UN Women, from UNFPA and the African Union to the Sahel region. And we went to Lake Chad to see and, and visit people, especially in Chad and Niger, um, and talk to them and uh, discuss also the role of women in peace building um, and uh, conflict resolution. And it was... Um, evident to all of us during that trip um, that uh, women, peace and security is, is an issue. It's not a women's issue, it's a peace and security issue. And uh, also an issue that holds um, the keys to, to sustainable peace. And from that trip, I also brought both hope and despair. Hope, I think, was inspired by all of these uh, girls and women that, that we met who had moved from victims to survivors to agents of, of change, by youth who uh, look at their futures with confidence, uh, despite very difficult circumstances. And I would mention one thing, uh, the fact that in both Chad and Niger, so many girls are married away uh, before they are even 16 and they give birth to up to seven children and of course can very often not go back to, to school. And uh, I think that these countries also will continue to face poverty unless they change, uh, especially these uh, things, to uh, provide education for, for everybody, for, for every child, but also in particular look at uh, the ways to um, get um, uh, girls into education. And also hope because of the vibrant and very active and determined civil society organizations that we met. Uh, and they work to improve the lives of, uh, of both men and, and, and boys and uh, women and girls across uh, uh, the region. Um, at the despair because of the chronic underdevelopment, because of terrorism and violent extremism, because of the lack for uh, respect for human rights and the negative effects of climate change. And um, it was so clear from flying over Lake Chad, and I don't have to tell you this, I think you probably know this much better, but, uh, but to me to understand that uh, Lake Chad has in, in uh, three decades uh, shrunk by 90%. So it's 10% it's left. It's more of, of puddles of water today um, with the small sort of islands, um, uh, green islands, uh, rather than uh, the big lake that used to uh, sustain the lives of millions and millions of people in, in all the countries dependent on, on the lake. And the women, they just described it very simply. They said, well, uh, before it was a big lake and it had big fish. So the men would do the fishing. Now it's a small lake and small fish. And now we can, we are allowed to do the fishing where we can fish. Um, and the one thing, if we ask them, what do you, what do you want? What do you wish from, from us? And they say, well, a new boat without so many holes, as the one we have now would be very good. And also some new nets, uh, also with lesser holes, would be very, uh, very helpful. They, they are trying their best. And also they're trying now to smoke the fish or find ways to, to deal with the fish that is not so much meat on any, any longer. And um, uh, and this was, I think, in a in a in a picture in an image of this kind, you you uh, can catch both the very serious development and effects of, of climate change, uh, but also the role of women. So now it's a it's a different role also for these women to sustain um, their their families through through fishing, but it was also a way of describing what happens. Um, security-wise, when, of course, if you cannot find water for your cattle or for growing things and uh, for, for drinking, then you have to move. And that's what, what people do in this region as well. And um, uh, then there will be conflicts over land rights and uh, uh, the, the grazing of cattle and uh, natural resources. 
uh, and that's the root uh, for root of social unrest and in the end conflicts and maybe even wars. And how terrorism also thrives in these areas because what are you supposed to do then? It's a it's a a, a land and a, a living situation that is very very poor. Uh, so especially young men are easily recruited. They are offered a few hundred dollars and a gun and maybe uh, also access to women, and um, that's exactly what, what happens. So this uh, young girl that we met, um, a beautiful young girl, and just that her dress looked a, li a bit strange, and we realized it was because she um, had no legs. And she told us that she was married away at around 15, and uh, her husband was recruited as a terrorist, and he took her to one of these small islands in, in uh, the lake, um, and that's where they uh, often have their, their camps, these uh, terrorists. And she was trained to become a suicide bomber. And she and another two girls were then sent to the market in Bol to, uh, to uh, set off the bombs. But uh, unfortunately, uh, these bombs uh, um, actually detonated earlier than, than thought. So the, the, the other two girls died, and this girl had her, her two legs blown blown off. And uh, uh, now she had decided to, to find another another life and another uh, way forward to study as a, as a lawyer and to, to contribute to, to society in, instead. And um, it's, it's very sort of non, in a very non-emotional way, but uh, still very, very determined about her own future and about uh, the, the future of a country. So all of these things come together in the worst of, of dynamics in a, in a society. Um, it starts with child marriage and then sort of ends with, with this kind of, of uh, being involved in, in terrorism or being, playing a role in, in terrorism. I think it is for, to me it has been clear from the very beginning that, uh, that uh, women, without women, how can we uh, get and achieve a sustainable peace? Uh, we, we have to ensure that within the Security Council, in the UN system, we have to recognize this and we have to work on it consistently and coherently. And uh, I also decided four years ago when I took office as foreign minister that I would declare that we would um, pursue a feminist foreign policy. And after some giggling maybe and some sort of hesitation from some of our ambassadors, I must say that it quickly turned into a very um, engaged um, uh, process and a very engaged work from all our embassies around the world. And I tried to make it very practical. I'm a practical person. I, I don't think we should spend too much time about the uh, sort of metaphysic uh, or theoretical discussions about the concepts or anything. I think it was good to call it feminist foreign policy because to me it's as simple as, as this. The definition must be that women, girls and women should enjoy the same rights and, and obligations and opportunities as, as men. And that's my starting point. And then uh, we should do it in a way that is also practical to look at do women enjoy the same rights, legal and human rights as, as men? Uh, are they represented? Do they have a voice? Are they around the table where important decisions are being made? And thirdly, what about resources? Are resources, budgetary and other resources, devoted also to the needs of, of girls and, and women? And that was the method or the parameters that I asked all my embassies also to use. <coughs> and we've seen fantastic uh, results. But basically, this is all about making sure that, that women also contribute to, um, to, to peace and security. Because without them, without them being having access to education, without them being trained as mediators or, or lawyers or what have you, how can they? How can they, they play a role in, in, in society? So this is also uh, what we've been doing. And I, I think uh, it has been now um, very well received. And I think, I hope it can serve as an inspiration to others. We've even made a handbook <coughs> that uh, um, I think the Swedish rep has, if uh, the Swedish mission uh, have uh, some some more copies of that, uh, but but it is really about the role of the United Nations. If we want to sustain 
make sustainable peace, then we have to involve uh, women. And it has to start early on, and it has to be sort of consistent in, in everything we do. And we have, I have forced my ambassadors and all the staff also in the mission here to always ask the question, where are the women? Are they there as peacekeepers? Are they there as negotiators? Are they mentioned in resolutions and presidential statements or press elements? Are they, are they found in the, in the system and respected for what they bring? Not that we are better than men. We would like to think so, but we, uh, that's not the point. Uh, we, we come with different uh, experiences and a different perspective. And that's exactly what they have found out, those who look at peace deals and peace agreements, that when women are involved, you have more options on the table and you have more sustainable peace uh, deals. And that is, I think, motive enough to continue this uh, work. And we do it thanks to all these fantastic organizations and NGOs all around the world. Um, they change the reality on the ground. And women in war situations, if you talk to women, that, which I have done, for example, also with the women in Syria, they have a very different perspective. Because very often they are the ones who also have to make sure that there is still food to, for the children, that there is electricity or water and, and that's where they will sort of start their, their in engagement very often. But they can also see the, the bigger picture. And I think this helps a lot, that, that women often take a, a somewhat different uh, approach to, to the things that are being uh, discussed also in, in a peace process. I could go on forever, so I will not uh, do that. I will. I will stop there. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. I'm now looking forward to uh, an interesting conversation uh, with the uh, audience and, uh, and Margate. But let me first thank you for what I found as a tremendously thoughtful and um, touching, actually, uh, introduction, comprehensive and very passionate and compassionate. So um, I think you're a role model for uh, many people who are sitting in this room. <laughs> but uh, let me, uh, before I open the floor, um, uh, let me ask you, uh, when uh, you and Sweden were in the Security Council and you were pursuing your feminist foreign policy, um, can you share with us some of the experiences, what reactions you got and what you think you achieved? And, uh, uh, how it felt to be, uh, in many ways, a revolutionary in the council. Um, uh, we decided early on on the things that we needed as our platform. And the platform was one built on respect for international law, um, for humanitarian law, for, um, um, uh, of course, um, democracy and, and, and human rights but also the women, peace and security agenda. And as well, we have had as one of our priorities children and armed conflict uh, as, as well. Uh, and we wanted to put more focus on conflict prevention. So we decided early on, these are the things that we will always fight for. This is the, really should be in our DNA or in our, on our platform, the one that we always stand on. So it means that we have, have invested a lot in uh, every, subject on the Security Council's agenda we've checked from the point of view of international law. Is this according to international humanitarian law? Can we defend this, uh, this formulation here? Can we, uh, uh, are they using the right definitions and so on? And women, peace and security became early on uh, one of the priority issues and it meant that we did exactly that, as a, or maybe as simple as that. We always asked, so our the women mentioned in, in resolutions. Is the language fine? Um, what exactly does this mean? Do they, uh, do they really, are they really given a role? So we have been very insisting every week. And in the end, all the others know that this is the, what Sweden will, will ask. And what we are hoping for is, of course, in the end, that first of all, that this will be respected. We will not be the only voice 
asking where are, where are the women, but others will also follow. And this is what is happening now. We see that uh, Germany, the European countries, but also others, they respect us because they know that this is consistent. It is not so just uh, for one day, but something that we have kept on uh, nagging on about for two years now, and we will continue because we are serious about it. And also we have invited, for example, women briefers, female briefers. So uh, last year uh, we had uh, half of all the brief briefers uh, women, and that was the first time. And also that it women, the role of women and women peace and security was mentioned in the <coughs> in all the presidential uh, statements as as well uh, last year. So you can measure a few things, not everything, but you can measure it. So I think it has. And we will then look at the structures. Are there gender advisors? Are there policies from the UN side and in the UN system that also supports the whole women, peace, and security agenda? So that's how we've tried to work on it. And in the end, our ambassador, Olaf Skog, said to me, well, I, you know, there have been moments when I've been thinking, what exactly does this change on the ground? That I always raise my hand and say, well, why don't we write women into the text as well? And then the whole Security Council traveled to Mali. And when they were in Mali, the women came up to him and said, you know what, thanks to that formulation in the Security Council resolution, we actually got a, a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And then he said, then I felt it was worth it. <laughs> Thank you. Very impressive. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's uh, not done yet. So it's just a <laughs> beginning of the things, but... Uh... Your dedication <laughs> is there so strongly. I'm opening the floor. Uh, could you please state your name and your affiliation and uh, raise your hand if you... Uh, if one, then I think I will start uh, on the front bench here. Uh, uh, shall I go right or left? Uh, I think I will go left. Uh. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rosie Cave, and I head up the Gender Equality Unit at the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to ask you a question. Um, and we're really grateful for all the leadership that you've shown on a feminist foreign policy. There's a lot that we look at on a daily basis in my team, thinking about how can we do better. Um, I wanted to ask you about sexual violence and conflict. We champion the Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict initiative, along with our Prime Minister's Special Representative on that, Lord Ahmed. I think one of the challenges that we're looking at, especially as we look ahead to our international meeting next November in 2019, is how do we manage to secure justice and accountability for survivors of sexual violence? This is an ongoing challenge. We look at contexts like Myanmar and Syria. How can we uphold the rights of those survivors who are so brave in coming forward and reporting, and the bravery of the individuals who document that as well? Thank you very much. Uh, I will then move from left to right for balance uh, on the front bench. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Larissa Galadza, and at the Foreign Ministry in Canada, I'm responsible for the ELSI Initiative for Women in Peace Operations and also for the Government of Canada's uh, Women, Peace and Security Action Plan. And I can tell you that you are indeed, uh, Minister, a, a role model for, for Canada in the development of, um, of our feminist uh, foreign policy. Um, I have two questions for you. First, um, um, is there something that you would have liked to have known before you launched into the feminist foreign policy that you would share um, with uh, with us that are uh, that are are following you and maybe other countries who uh, who might be looking to take uh, the same path. And then the second, my second question is. Um, uh, you've uh, when the feminist foreign policy was launched i think it was I, th I think it was really the women peace and security action plan that um enlivened it and, and really explained to our network of diplomats um what um gave them some ideas of of what we're talking about when it comes to women and and, and peace and security and you mentioned some of the questions that you th you sent out and said this, this is how you think in a feminist way about your context but I find that examples of 
what can be done really resonates with our uh, with our emissaries uh, uh, abroad, um, and they are there. They are ready and willing participants, advocates, champions of this. But and you're a great storyteller. So can you give us some stories or a story of of, of something that you've seen done, maybe in a fragile and conflict affected context, by your diplomats in a way that brought that feminist foreign policy or the women, peace, and security agenda um, there? not beyond asking questions or, or funding projects. What did the diplomats do that made a difference? Uh, Margaret, I will take one more intervention before uh, I come back to you. Can we then, uh, I, I think it's fair now to go, uh, it's to have the front bank to go to the back benches. So we'll do it uh, over there. Hello, uh, Stephanie Johansson with the Women's Refugee Commission. Thank you, Minister, and we're a proud member of the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security. And my question would be, how can we ensure that the countries who adopt a feminist policy also apply this to any part of their policies, including um, migration policies, arms exports, and so on, or speaking out to on women human rights defenders so that there is that understanding that it's not just on the Security Council, but more than that. Thank you. Thank you for great comments and very good questions. I'm now reverting to you, uh, Margot. You okay, th I'll try to answer uh, sh shortly to these questions. First of all, what about justice for victims? How do we, what is the next step? And actually this morning we had a fantastically interesting discussion uh, at uh, the Swedish mission on how do we, what about money and corruption also engaged in uh, all these activities that in the end uh, bring, you know, a rape as a, a weapon or, or a, a strategy in, in war and, and conflict situations. There is so much money involved. And uh, why is it that, for example, when, when uh, we have uh, trials uh, for um, for um, for crimes against uh, uh, humanity, uh, that there is not always a part about also, but how could they afford to do this? What about those who, uh, who uh, provide weapons? What about those who uh, make sure that uh, that these warlords can go on with, with, with uh, everything that they are doing? And I think that consistently we must look at that as well, because that could also give some money to the victims. And this is maybe the, the part that is the least uh, uh, provided for today, the compensation to, to uh, victims. And um, I, I have seen that myself. And they very often women, they don't even ask for, for that. I mean, they, they just, if we, if we just can make sure that these, these um, persons are, are uh, prosecuted, that they are um, punished in one way or the other, that's, that's fine. They don't dare to even think about uh, uh, being compensated for their suffering. And very often there have been, in, at national level, you can be a war veteran, but the women who have been raped and hurt that way, I, I've, I've met with women who said, you know, sometimes I wish that I had lost an arm or had a, a visible scar, but these things that have uh, turned me into a, a cripple in many ways is not compensated. I am not a war veteran, uh, despite the fact that these crimes have been committed against me. So I think this is a whole block of, of issues that I, I don't have all the answers to, but I think this morning it was a very interesting um, track that, that I think we should follow. And also we have to make sure that we use the ICC to uh, uh, also send these cases, and especially now when it comes to Myanmar and the, the crimes against uh, the Rohingyas, uh, we have insisted on uh, making sure that this is sent to the ICC and that they deal with it. Um, uh, are there things that I wish I had known? Um, I may, sometimes it's better not to know that much. <laughs> Oh, you just you don't know you just you just have to deal with the things that that come up but you have to be I think you just have to be convinced that this is the right thing to do and it is easier because I was also a member of a government that is a feminist government so we have 50 50 men and women in the government we pursue a, a feminist policy also in in other areas 
Uh, and of course, that is a work in progress. That is not uh, perfect, but, uh, but this is something that we uh, are checked upon. And our budget is also one that is uh, uh, gender disaggregated, and we have sort of the, f we try to get the facts and so on. And I get that question often, so how can you have, you know, you're a country that also exports weapons, so how is that compatible with having a feminist foreign policy? Uh, well, nothing will be better if we don't have a feminist foreign policy, but, but it's good that these questions are being asked. So uh, what the way we deal with the fact that we are a weapons exporting country is that we have also one of the world's strictest legislations when laws when it comes to to uh, how, how we can export uh, or export weapons. Uh, ideally, of course, you, we would not have it, if you ask me, but uh, this is a reality since uh, decades back, since we are also a, a militarily non-aligned country. Um, and we have now added a, a democracy criterion to the, to the uh, criteria that, we are, that are being used for what countries we can export to. But I think migration is really an area where we are lagging behind. We have not been looking at with, with uh, I would say, comprehensive strategies for, for looking at the needs of girls and women in, in the migration flows and in our policies. Uh, so that, that I, I feel a bit, uh, is the next, uh, I feel a bit ashamed of. And I think that we should do much uh, better. And together, I would say, also in the European Union, for example, and in the UN. Um, what, can I give some stories? I think uh, some. <sighs> I think it's, it ranges from everything from where ambassadors would come back and say, you know what, we started to think of who, who are we inviting to the, to our, the embassy for different uh, events and meetings and so on. Uh, are we really thinking of, of also the women or enough many women that, that we also listen to? Do we do that in a consistent way? So it was also their own approach, but then we've had everything from exhibitions uh, about Swedish dads, you know, the fact that we have a pater paternal leaf and, and how that is being used and, and pictures from, from that that raised so much interest in Rwanda that it was the talk of the town or the whole country for a long time. Um, to, and it changes the norms to how we export our legislation on prostitution or the fact that we um, all the time look at, so what about child marriages in this country? What about FGM? What about uh, uh, education? Do girls, do they have access to, to education? So you can look at it in a very practical way, thanks to these uh, three R's, you know, the rights, representation and resources uh, uh, method. But um, um, I, I think it has been, I think there are some more examples in the handbook as well of, of the things that have been done. And I'm proud over the network, the fact that we have trained so many uh, women mediators and negotiators because they are now deployed. We have 15 of them and they are all deployed to different war and conflict situations around the world, from Colombia to Syria to uh, Afghanistan. <coughs> and Iraq, and they help with everything from uh, helping to train women who want to run as political candidates. Um, you know, what do they need to know if they are to stand as, as candidates to actually helping the parties, um, women in, in the opposition in a, um, in a country um, that also want to be part of a peace process, for example. So, so this is, um, just, these are just a few examples. Thank you again, uh, Margaret. I can see we have uh, about 25 minutes uh, left, uh, and since it's a great privilege to have the uh, opportunity to have a dialogue with Margaret, I would ask you to keep your interventions as short as possible so that Oops. as many of you as possible can engage in our conversation. For gender balance, I will now start with the gentleman. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much for you. We owe a deep debt of gratitude to you for articulating so effectively the first feminist foreign policy in the world. I think if I may correctly quote your sentences on feminism, 
I think uh, it has become an inspiration to many, many of us. You said feminism is a component of a modern way on global, modern view on global politics. It is about smart policy, which includes the whole population, uses all potential, and leaves no one behind. Change is possible, necessary, and long overdue, end of quote. This is, I think I quoted exactly, but this is what is happening. And I would like to say that in one area, change is negligible, even if at all happening. And this is the area of macroeconomic policymaking. As a promoter of macroeconomic orthodoxy, International Monetary Fund has been advising governments about undertaking policy in their own countries, which actually is subverting women's equality and women's participation. And this is happening despite all our efforts about 1325, about goal uh, SDG 5, everything. And I think with the best of interest, many, I am from Bangladesh myself, many governments in our countries fail to really make progress because they surrender to the pressures of IMF who determines their uh, financial um, uh, policy articulation. And that uh, tells me that with UN leadership having no say or no collegial uh, cooperation with IMF and World Bank, only in name, and IMF has recently started speaking about um, women's equality, but it's not working. So I believe that with us talking about SDG 5, while IMF at the national level is subverting that. What can we do? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then we will go to the lady uh, in the middle row with the blue scarf. And uh, I don't like to repeat myself, but uh, please remember that we only have very little time left, so uh, we have to give as many as possible the possibility of taking the floor. No you problem. Have... Um, my name is Christina Koch. I'm Chief of Recruitment in the Department of Field Support. I want to really thank you, Minister, because of the contributions you make to peacekeeping, in particular the, the women, the uniformed women in particular, who um, are an inspiration um, in their work. I recently was in Mali, and the two UN police officers providing security at the mosque in Timbuktu were Swedish women. And so, you know, I just wanted to say that it really provides a lot of inspiration when your uniformed women are out there serving in harm's way. They're not sitting behind desks um, doing administrative work. They're in harm's way and they're doing the work of men. And that has a knock on effect in the mission. Um, it starts to change the dynamic and it starts to also inspire the civilians um, who are also um, working and um, we hope that you can do more, obviously, and we'd love to hear a little bit more about um, how you um, intend to do more and give more to peacekeeping, women and men included. Thank you. Uh, then I will go to the lady on the left on the front row, on the second row. Hello, my name is Marina Prihotko. I'm a UN representative of the World Federation of Ukrainian Women's Organizations. Um, we are currently working on a project in the Eastern Europe, Central Asian region called the Women's Peace Dialogue Platform. And we take as a model the Swedish Women's Mediation Network. And we are confronted today with the reality that there may be very soon an international peacekeeping mission or force present in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, however, our women uh, working in mediation, peace building, conflict resolution in the region are divided between women who see this as an opportunity to do what Sweden has done so well 
and insert and assert themselves in this peacekeeping mission. And on the other hand, there are women who feel that they will be entirely ignored, that this will be taking, uh, this matter will be taken to a s otherworldly international level, which continues to ignore women in some aspects. So I wanted to ask if you could comment on how a country who is about to uh, welcome a peacekeeping mission to its territory to hopefully find peace can effectively include women in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will take two more interventions before we go back to uh, to, um, to Margaret. Uh, I will go to the to my right hand here uh, to the lady there. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Regine Guevara, and I'm from the UN Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, I've been engaging on the youth peace and security platform in Israel and Palestine and in the ASEAN region, and I've only started to read up more about the women peace and security platform. So I was wondering if there are what are what do you think are the concrete midpoints? And if there are concrete platforms where the two intersect, youth peace and security and women peace and security. For instance, um, the current debates going on right now in the youth sector is what is youth participation versus meaningful youth engagement? Like how do we go beyond youth tokenism and um, promoting individual youth leaders so that we can access the larger youth constituency in those that are furthest left behind. So are there things that we can learn from the women's movement with regards to this? Thank you. Uh, I would then go to the gentleman on the front row on my uh, second row on my left. Uh, my name is Ram Chalori and I am with the International Peace Organization in Princeton. I, I want to bring the issue local to the US. As you know, there is a lot of migration from Central America to the US at the border. And there are a lot of um, uh, families displaced, and particularly with children separated from the mothers. What exactly would you think should be done, and how soon can it be done? Thank you, good question. Uh, then uh, uh, the lady on the second row in the center section. Thank you, Minister Wallstrom. Nina LaHood, I was for years with the UN and DPKO and now with the board of the Stockholm-based International Legal Assistance Consortium. Um, you've raised the prism of gender through policies, national and multilateral institutions and resources. And I wanted to come back to the resources part. Uh, yourself having served in such an important position in the UN and seen the UN structures of peacekeeping missions in the field. Uh, my question is, um, given the recent peace and security reform of the UN presented to the member states and endorsed, we saw very little change on the gender front or the gender architecture, uh, including gender architecture for the field. And I wanted to know um, it, uh, what, what you f feel about that. Um, it, it, uh, from years of being in the field and missions and all, I really think unless there's strength in architecture and more integrated, less siloed architecture and resources to support that architecture, um, and every, any Security Council resolution or presidential statement isn't going to get that much traction on the ground. Thank you. I will take one more question. I, I, I think the lady also on the second row in the center. Second row is unanimous. So I'm Cora Weiss from the International Peace Bureau. Welcome. I think your leadership demonstrates that one person can make a difference, one woman person can make a difference, and it's making a huge difference. Canada just had a meeting of all the women foreign ministers. That hasn't happened before. So you have three R's, we have three P's, participation of women, prevention of violent conflict, and protection of women girls, 1325. And you call for women, just speak about women as if women were one group of like-minded people. 
We used to call for a critical mass years ago. And now we are finding that the world is full of Le Pens and Sarah Palins, and I could, everybody in this room could add names. And they could become a critical mass. A lot of the Trump base are women. A lot of the Tea Party in this country are women. A lot of women are in the right wing parties growing up in Europe. So I have started to talk about peace and justice loving women because I think it takes more than ovaries for us to do what you're calling for. I wonder what you think about that. Thank you very much, Margot. Uh, lots of very challenging questions here. You have the floor. Yeah, why did you have any simple questions uh, for me? Um, my goodness, can I even answer to all of this? I, as somebody said, feminism is a radical notion that women are human beings. Uh, I, I think that's maybe uh, the answer still. Um, the fact is that the World Bank, in a report, um, um, showed us that there are more than 100 countries that still have provisions that uh, prohibit women from taking on certain jobs, and totally unnecessarily. Uh, worst of them, I think, was Russia, uh, so women cannot uh, drive a, a metro train or whatever it's called in, in Russia. Uh, but uh, even France has a number of, of professions that women cannot take up. And I think that this is one of these very uh, practical tasks that we could make sure that women are not discriminated against uh, when it comes to choosing what job they want to, they want to have. I, th this is why I'm saying, you know, women are not um, better than men, but we, we bring another perspective. And of course, I hope that women will also be uh, loving in peace and, and justice, and that that is a very important uh, uh, quality. But, uh, um, but, but I think it's, for me, it's a matter of democracy, because women make up uh, uh, half the population. And uh, uh, if you um, sort of in, create a society where, where women are sort of systematically discriminated against, it's a democratic problem. And in some of these countries, there are even a majority. And still, they are not allowed to go to school, or they are, they are married away, so they cannot choose whom they want to, to marry or, or what to do, so they cannot influence their own lives. And that's, that's my starting point, and this is where I think it is a, a foreign policy issue as, as well. But I also believe in, in gender equality. And I would say since, since sort of the beginning of time, uh, it, has very, it has been a majority of men who have also been the soldiers, the, the fighters, the ones who have sort of carried that, uh, the, uh, done those things, while women have been traditionally the ones also caring for, for the children and, and the homes and so on. And now we, luckily, we are in a situation where we can share much more of the responsibility and hopefully also having learned something from the wars that uh, this is not a, a good way to, to, to live together, to, to fight each other. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that the IMF and the World Bank also have, have to, to look at these, uh, these uh, issues. And I, of course, belong to my political um, affiliation and, and, and my political view is that uh, societies with two uh, big differences and, and gaps and divides between people economically and socially are not very good societies to live in. I think that if you have a society where some are extremely rich and we don't have to mention uh, those countries' names, we, we know who they are, and, but, and some are so dirt poor, um, will will never be good societies to live in. I really believe in 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 evening it, it out, uh, not to, that everybody can have exactly the same, but but I think we should do everything to provide uh, equality and also gender equality as as much as as possible. I think the the situation in Bangladesh you can also compare it with with Japan because in Japan these days they know that they will not be able to grow their economy unless they also have more women in their workforce. 
it would be simply impossible. And the way we uh, in the Nordic countries, for example, um, got so wealthy and I, th I think so pro such prosperous countries was partly because we made all of these reforms, meaning that uh, women could actually enter the, the workforce, the labor force. They could do so because there, were, there was childcare, affordable childcare, that also there was a way to, to take care of the elderly. Uh, and uh, we just found reforms that would make it possible for both men and, and, and women to, to work and to have, um, to sustain themselves and, and their families. And I think that's how, that's what Japan is looking at right now as well. How do you how do you create the, the uh, uh, reforms to allow women to get into the workforce? Uh, yeah, thank you for saying that about uh, about Mali, and uh, we have um, contributed in in Mali. So, so at the same time, it's the deadliest mission we we have in in the UN, and and we are indeed very grateful to those who who are willing to take on the job in, in harm's uh, way. And, and we appreciate that. We will continue as much as we can to contribute. You know that we've contributed to every, both civilian and military mission that the European Union has uh, uh, initiated, has decided on. And we will continue to, to be loyal also to the UN system as, as much as we can and can afford. I, I, I think we, we could have had many more um, soldiers as well, or UN um, staff, but uh, that is for for the coming uh, coming government. You know that I represent. I'm I'm only a minister in a caretaker government, so be careful with what what I say. <laughs> I cannot I cannot promise anything until we have a new government. So uh, Ukraine, this is so important. What what you are saying, so important, and this is also my experience. You can get to almost any conflict around the world and women will come up and say, well, you know, we have a small organization and we have met with women on the other side. We meet regularly and we think we might have a few solutions or some ideas for how, on how to solve this conflict. And you think, so why not try the women? Why not let them, <laughs> uh, let them uh, steer the, the peace processes? Because very often they do it, but sort of silently under the radar, but they really want to be engaged and taken into, into account. So this is an, an extremely important point. And we can, those of us who are um, aware of this, will just have to insist on making sure that women are there. I think the UN system or the European Union or those that are donors or funders always have to, have to ask, so where are the women? Why are they not represented? We cannot do this, we cannot achieve peace unless there are women also. The women are being asked that they can contribute uh, to any peace process. So let's keep an eye on that. And let's hope that we will get a peace uh, um, a mission also. Uh, and uh, who I wish I could give you an answer to the question about youth. To me, it's, uh, it's clear we've never had such a big youth uh, generation on this planet so many young people as we have today. So of course they also have to be there. Uh, so I think we just have to continue to, to ask how, how can we ensure a representation of also of young people? We cannot only be middle-aged or pensioners, uh, you know, in, in all of these bodies and uh, around the table. So to me, it's, um, it's a matter of, of making sure that they are, that they are represented. But I, I don't know uh, too much about exactly where the UN system is with, uh, with these resolutions and the, the follow-up. I wish I was better informed, but I, I, to me it's a natural thing. And very often, if, for example, if we go to travel to Africa and all of these situations, most uh, um, majority of the population, they are very, very young. And, and this is also a hopeful thing. Um, oh. Children separated from, you know, I'm a, I'm a grandmother, and uh, I can, I can uh, see, the, uh, you know, you're, it's heartbreaking. And of course, this should not happen. They cannot do things like this. And I think there was a reaction also in this country that was so strong that they had to back off from, uh, from what, the, what they had done. So, I mean, that's, that should not happen according to any rules. Is this a gesture meaning that I should think about time? Yes. <laughs> And, uh, and finally, gender, um, I think also, 
yes, um, the whole, the reform, which we have applauded and we have been very active and tried to be helpful in the process of supporting the Secretary General in the, all the reform efforts and changes. I think we have to keep an eye on the fact that it is not given that there are gender advisors or that the, sort of the, the uh, gender system is, is put in place. So we just have to insist on that and we have to keep an eye on exactly what happens on the ground so that this is not lost. Uh, and why should this always come last when we know that it's, it's, uh, it will help us so much if we actually respect the, the whole system we have set up for making sure that the gender perspective is there and uh, carried out consistently. Thank you. I, did I yeah. forget the most difficult ones, probably, but uh, <laughs> no, next okay. time. And I can see your staff is now getting very nervous. Yes, yeah, yeah, nervous they are. They are next appointment. So, <laughs> so, so let me uh, wrap up by saying I think everybody in this room, including myself, have deeply appreciated uh, that uh, you have been with us here today and given us this opportunity to have a, a, a dialogue with you and. Uh, for you to be so generous to share with us your uh, insightful uh, thoughts, which are forward-looking, and also your profound compassion. So please join me in um, thanking and saluting Margaret uh, for all she has you. done. Thank you. Thank and you. And urge her to carry on her good work. <laughs> <laughs>